We have come to the end of the book of Ruth, and in it we see God transform tragedy into triumph, and that's what I want to look at today. Well, hey guys, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to our series, Life in the Word. And I can't believe it, but we've already come to the end of the first book that we're checking out. And if you're new to this series, first of all, we've been going through the book of Ruth. And this series as a whole, Life in the Word, is all about just simple Bible study. You know, here on this channel, we're passionate about simplicity. And I think there's something really beautiful in just opening up the Bible together, seeing what God has to say in it, see what is in there for us that we can learn. Hopefully I can help you in some of that. Then we can all seek to apply it to our lives. I think it's a powerful thing that we can easily overlook in looking for things that are new or novel, but really there's something beautiful in the basics of Bible study. And so today, like I said, we've come to the end of the book of Ruth, and it has been such a joy for me to go through this, and I hope it has been for you as well. And I want to say, first of all, if you're not up to speed with the book of Ruth, I will link the other videos up there, and you can either pause this video and go watch them or watch them after this, so you can get a greater appreciation for how we got to where we're at here in Ruth chapter 4. As always, we'll look at a little bit of background today, and I want to give you a couple points to look at, and then we will see how we can apply that to our lives. I think there's a lot in this chapter for us. So without further ado, I want to let you go ahead and read the chapter. As always, I encourage you to pause this video. Take a moment to read the chapter. You'll get a lot more out of it if you do it. So go ahead and do that now. All right, now that you've done that, let's go ahead and jump into it. And today I don't want to spend too much time on background because really we've understood a lot of the important cultural background or historical background things for this book. We've explored concepts related to agriculture in this story. We've explored concepts related to foreigners and relationships within Israelite society. Perhaps more importantly, we've explored concepts relating to redemption and kinsman redeemers and Leverite marriage. And again, if you haven't seen those, you can check out those previous videos. But I don't want to rehash all of that today. In fact, I want to be able to kind of jump into it here. So in that very first paragraph, in verses 1 through 6, we see that Boaz is doing what he said he was going to do. In chapter 3, we saw Ruth tell Boaz, look, like, let's get married. You're my redeemer. Redeem me is more or less a really quick summary of what happens there. And it's Naomi's plan that she puts into action. But Boaz says, well, there's actually one complication. You see, while I am a kinsman redeemer, I'm not the closest relative to you. So actually someone else has the right and the obligation to do that for you, to step in and to provide for you and to marry you. But if he refuses, I am all in, he says. So in that first section, that's what we see happen. Boaz waits for this guy and he comes and he starts to explain to him. And for a second, it looks like the guy's into it. And then that creates this tension like, no, we thought Ruth and Boaz, they were going to get together and be happily ever after. But the guy doesn't fully understand the implications of what's going on. And that's actually pretty understandable. If you remember our conversation around redemption, remember that redemption didn't just have to do with widows. It also had to do with property. And for this guy, it seems that he thought that in being asked to redeem this, that he was just redeeming the land, adding land to his family, adding it to his portfolio, essentially. Like This had some economic benefits for him. But then he finds out that Ruth's involved. And it's understandable that he wouldn't have initially thought of this because this is a bit of a stretch of that concept of Leverite marriage. This is a distant relative. It's not like his brothers. And so it wasn't crystal clear that the text in Deuteronomy say that he would have to take care of Ruth. But that's the implication that Boaz gives him. And when he hears that, he says, you know what? No, I can't do it. And it's really noteworthy what he says. If you look in verse 6, it says, Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. You see, in this moment, we see fear coming over him because he's realizing, well, A, he could have already had another wife. Could he really afford to take Ruth into his household in this land? Well, then she would have sons and that would complicate things. And it really isn't beneficial for him. This now looks like a charitable thing and he's no longer interested. You see, in this instance, we see him putting more stock in his fears than his faith in God. And my first point for you today with this text is trust God over your fears. You see, he's going to miss out on so much because God has a plan and a purpose for Ruth's life. This book is named after Ruth, but 
Instead, he becomes this unnamed person that simply missed out on so much that God wanted to do simply because he said, you know what, I'm not interested. But going further in the text, we see that once he says he's not interested, Boaz steps in, they get married. And what's interesting is how the text actually ends up focusing on Naomi. Something you'll notice as you read the book of Ruth is that despite it being named for Ruth and Ruth being the main character, Naomi plays a very important role. In fact, a lot of the tension is in Naomi's emotions, not in Ruth's. At the beginning of the story, we saw in Ruth chapter 1 that Naomi says that the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. She comes back empty. She left full with husbands and sons, and she comes back a widow, childless, only with her daughters-in-law. She says, God has turned against me. He's abandoned me. She wants to change her name because it doesn't reflect who she is anymore. But then at the end of the story, we see that the joy really comes first and foremost through the eyes of Naomi. It picks up here in verse 14. It says, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. You see, the story really comes full circle here. From the tragedy in the beginning, God takes it, he transforms it, and then joy is brought out of it. Like I said at the very intro, tragedy is transformed into triumph. And I think we see something so important in this and something very timely. You see, we can find ourselves in situations where it feels like God has dealt bitterly with us, where it feels like God has abandoned us, when everything points towards God not being for us, when everything in our life is trending down, when everything seems to be bringing us to our lowest. We're tempted to be like Naomi and say, God has turned against me. We're tempted to give up at this point and say that this is just how life is going to be, to redefine ourselves as someone who has been dealt with poorly, to say that my life is essentially over. But God always gets the final word. God had bigger plans for Naomi. She just couldn't see them. What I want to encourage you is to adopt a long view that your present difficulties don't mean that God has turned against you. Your present difficulties don't even mean that in the future you will not see the faithfulness of God once again. Perhaps God is preparing you right now in this season of trials, like many of us are going through with coronavirus and the economic downturn and everything that's going on. Perhaps God is preparing you in this season for what he's going to do in the next. If you've been watching my channel for any amount of time, you know I have a real soft spot for rhyming important points, not because I think they make me sound clever. In fact, I think they do much the opposite. They sound a little cheesy, but you will remember them. I found that in my life. If something is rhymed, it's so much easier to remember, and there's science behind this. And so bear with me, because this might sound a little cheesy, but I think this actually is something to help you, and that might stick with you. And that is this. Just like Naomi thought life was bitter for her, I want to encourage you that even when life is bitter, don't be a quitter. Even when life is bitter, don't be a quitter. I know it's kind of cheesy, but you'll remember that. And I want to encourage you that in this time when it feels like life is bitter and it's difficult, don't quit. Don't give up. Adopt the long view and trust that your present difficulties do not preclude God's blessing in the future. There is hope for you. And as Christians, we always have a hope that even if this life throws everything at us horribly, we have hope in Jesus that this is not the end of our lives, that the time between our birth and our death is only but a tiny, tiny fraction of our existence with God. And so we always have hope. We adapt a long view. We set our minds on what is above, not on what is of this earth, because we are citizens of heaven. And that does not mean we are escapists, but that means that we live into our present reality with a hope for the future that allows us to be grounded and always say that even if it's difficult, even when life is bitter, I will not quit. The final thing I want to explore with you in this book, which I know would be easy to write off and not even pay attention to because it's a genealogy. And I know I've been there that when you read a genealogy, it's like, oh my, like I don't care name after name that I don't know. But in this one, if you've been reading your Bible for any time, you should recognize that this is not just a genealogy to sleep through. This is an important one. And plus it's short, so you can get through it, trust me. But what we see is that through Ruth's faithfulness, through Naomi's knowledge of the law, telling Ruth to live into that, right? That she saw like what God's will is and she said, let's move into that, let's press into that. Through Boaz's faithfulness, through all these things coming together, 
King David is born. And there's so much here. In fact, you could say that the entire story has been leading up to this point. And some scholars would say that the entire point of this book is to give you the genealogy of David. Now, I think that might be a little overstated, but there is some amount of truth in that. That this is the climax of the story. This isn't just an addendum, but this is giving context to this whole story. Because after all, like, what's the importance of this story? It's very mundane and granted. It's, it's great what we see here, but it'd be easy to write it off. Like, why did the Israelites keep this story? But then you realize that this is a powerful backstory to King David. This is a powerful origin story for him. And there's so many implications of this, not least of which that David descends from a Moabite woman. You know, all throughout Israelite history, there's a lot of tension between Israelites and people of other nations because the Israelites are called to remain pure and holy, to be a nation of priests, to represent God to the world, and that when they intermarry and when they intermix with other nations, it never goes well for them. But in this case, we see a foreigner being portrayed in a wonderful light, that she is faithful, that she adopts the God, the Israelites, and it's a precursor to what we see in the New Testament, that the Gentiles are included in the family of faith, that God's family has always been more than just the Israelites. God's plan was, yes, to bless the Israelites, but it was not to end with the Israelites. It was that he would bless the Israelites, and through blessing them, they would be a blessing to the world. And in this story, we see the beginnings of that. And it's beautiful. And we see that someone like King David, a man after God's own heart, one of the most highly esteemed people of the Old Testament, well, he comes from a line that includes Ruth. And in the New Testament, we see that she's included in the genealogies of Jesus. And so what that tells me, most importantly about this story, not only God's plan for the Gentiles, for the entire world, but it tells me that there is no small act of obedience. There is no small act of obedience. You never know what one tiny step of faith, what one small act of obedience could end up producing. In fact, when we see what it produces, we realize there is no small act of obedience. There is no small step of faith that God works through. God honors your faithfulness. And that when you are faithful in the small things, you may never see it, you may never know, but God is working through that to produce something beautiful. Ruth simply clung to her mother-in-law. She simply did what was right. Naomi took her knowledge of the law and passed it to Ruth and told her to act on it. Boaz said, I will have integrity and do what's right. All of these things, they might have felt small, but they led to King David, and that would change the entire shape of Israelite history. There is no small act of obedience. So I think with all of this, it's easy to see how this can translate to your life. First of all, we saw that we need to trust God over our fears. We can't just say, oh, this is scary, so I can't do it. No, we, we trust God. If it's God's will, we press into it. Second, we adopt that long view. Even in present difficulties, we say, you know, I'm looking ahead. I'm looking past this because I know that the hope I have for the future can help me live into this in such a way that I see this not as a wall, not as a dead end, but as a highway to where God is leading me. And finally, if we really internalize that truth that there is no small act of obedience, well, then it puts in a different light and context those tiny choices that we make every day. And we realize these aren't small. But what I do now, not only is it shaping me, but it is shaping things that I have no idea about. That God honors your faithfulness and your obedience even when no one sees it, even when it feels small. It is significant. Well, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Truly, it is a joy to make these videos. And I can't believe we've already finished our first book. I can't wait to jump into the next. But again, if you've watched this far, you're seriously the best, and I am so thankful for you. To all of you guys who have been liking and commenting on these videos, who have been sharing these with your friends because you think they'd enjoy them, to all of you who have subscribed to become a part of this channel, you guys are seriously the best. It means so much to me, seriously. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. If you're new, this is Gospel Simplicity, and we're passionate about the beautiful simplicity and transformative power of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. If that's something you're interested in, I would encourage you to hit subscribe to become a part of what we're doing here on this channel. But until next time, I encourage you to be on the lookout for more videos. And as always, be sure to go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that changed the world. Peace. Love you guys so much. I'll see you next time.